Hello, everybody. This is Bob Ose. It's Theater Resources Unlimited's Friday Community Gathering, um, TRU, we're called. We're, we're an arts organization um, that is very proud to announce that we got a NISCA grant of $25,000 um, just uh, this past couple weeks. Uh, um, and we're thrilled about that. And NISCA believes in what we do, and we hope that you believe in what we do. And what we do, among other things, is we try to demystify theater for uh, people uh, who are coming into the profession. Uh, in particular, we teach um, the aspects of business that people need to know in order to navigate the business more easily, more successfully. Uh, we focus on producers and uh, we also have lots and lots of writers who are with us and, and actors and, and directors. Um, and uh, everybody, all of these people on, uh, in, uh, on March 15th, 2020, suddenly found out that they didn't know what to do with themselves because we were told that there's something out there called COVID and that we had to go into something called quarantine. Oh, I can't believe it. Uh, we, we actually we actually have been through that and uh, we opened this room so that people in the community could be here and come together and talk to each other and not feel as isolated. And uh, I'm told that I saved the sanity of several people in the, in the theater community by doing this. Uh, we've continued doing it. One thing that happened uh, from the COVID that I thought was pretty amazing. This is, we're in New York. Basically, before COVID, everything we did sort of revolved around New York. Um, didn't happen once we opened up a, a Zoom room. We suddenly have people from all over the world. We have somebody here from Germany today, and we have people from all over the country. Um, and we love that. And we're going to keep doing this. Uh, we're going to stay. Uh, thank you, COVID. That's one, like, one nice thing you did for us. Thank you. Um, and uh, because of COVID, we are kind of a global community now, which is thrilling, absolutely thrilling for me. Um, bewildering too, but it's it's pretty exciting. So uh, conversations have changed. Uh, we're, we're allegedly out of COVID. If you talk to the people in my room right now, <laughs> they'd say, no, we're not. <laughs> we're I, I just got over it. <laughs> you did? Oh my God, no. I, I am just negative today. Oh, congratulations! Yeah. Were, were, were you okay the night of your of your of your uh, reading of your show? Yeah, I got it the next day. But in well, that that's reading, what you, that's what you get for getting in, getting to the Symphony Theater of uh, in a sell sell out crowd of people. Uh, I know, but in but in the forty eight hours before that presentation, four people came down with COVID. In your we company, were, including at noon on the day of the performance, the lead. The and lead? You had a lead. substitute lead? I was yeah. there, by the way, everybody. I'm talking, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed because the lead was terrific that we saw. Well, he had he had actually done it. He had read it before, so it wasn't totally new to him. Um, but he, And he didn't know the songs. But then I moved someone from the company up into his part, a woman who, a friend of, of, of a friend, was willing to come in and learn of the small part of, that, of a woman. And... Uh, um, and I went on for Pinch Wife. You were terrific. You were actually, yeah, yeah. you were just a revelation. It was amazing. Uh, well, I, I do know the show. <laughs> but, but the thing, Richard, what's, well, we're good, I didn't finish my intro, but what, what, let me just say, the thing that was, was impressive about you is you are very funny and you do not push it at all. You are so understated and so right on in terms of in terms of the humor of, of, your, of your work. Of course, that might be because you understand the humor of your work. <laughs> Well, but, yeah, we, we can talk about the style. There's a, a tricky style which would take actors longer than a week to get. And you and, you just mastered it in a night? Well, I just know it. I mean, I okay. just, you know, I instinctively know what it has to be. So so, so congratulations on that. Um, and back to my viewers out there, I just want to let you know that um, we encourage you to uh, be a part of our community. So if you're out there and you found us on YouTube or on a podcast, uh, please email me, trunltd at aol.com, trunltd at aol.com. And uh, I'll invite you every bloody week for the rest of your life to come to a, and join us on Fridays. We have some interesting people coming up. Next week, we have um, a cabaret uh, performer and producer. Her name is Sumitsuki. Um, and in uh, January, we already have booked John Malpitas, who uh, runs a company called LA Poverty Department, which is a community involved um, arts organization in LA that uh, deals with impoverished communities and brings um, people living in slums into theater and 
tries to make changes happen. So he's going to be an interesting guy. Um, so uh, I'm going to come back to Richard now, and we're going to actually start talking about stuff. I mean, I'm I'm particularly wait, Richard. You, I'm going to say this for everybody else because you already know this. You you've been a a big influence on me as a writer, and you're somebody that I've admired for forever. And I, I, as you know, my aunt was was one of the people that worked with with Jim Friedberg, your producer. Oh um, yes, I remember that. Yes. Yeah. So I, I have been incredibly aware of you and incredibly inspired by you for many many years. Um, and I think there's a lot of people in this room who, who might feel the same way as, as I do. Um, there there are things that I've learned about you. The thing, things that I've figured out that I guess we I should have known. Um, it never dawned on me that Richard Maltby, who directs and wins Tonys, is, and Richard Maltby, who writes lyrics and and has Broadway shows produced, you, you are you are the same person, aren't you? We, I am, I am, <laughs> yeah. I am, yeah. yeah. Um, so th that's one of the things that fascinates me. Uh, um, I started doing a series of interviews called Balancing Act. I started it with Austin Pendleton, who acts, uh, directs, uh, writes, and. Uh, I find it interesting to talk to artists about the different facets of their career and why, what your attractions are to each each aspect of it and, and what it is you love about writing, what it is you love about directing and how you've balanced it all these years. Um, give us a little bit back, a background on you. I mean, you start, did you well, start with writing? I, I, no, I, I, I... I mean, actually, they're not, for me, distinctive. They're, I want to create the musical. And the musical, that means somebody has to write it, and that means somebody has to direct it. I mean, uh, the creation of the show um, uh, is is what... Is, that's, I mean, the director is the author of the musical, of the finished musical. Um, and uh, so it, it is not a big stretch to be to do one or the other. What you do lose is the um uh is the 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 critical mind of another of another person. Um however um I found <laughs> early on in my career uh that um I was as likely to be misled by the critical mind of the other person as uh as uh um inspired by it or clarified by it. Um, so, um, I mean, I became a, I, I finally determined that I wanted to be uh, directing my own work um, after I had been, uh, I, I, <laughs> I'd seen it mangled by other directors, you know. I, mean, I think that what I write is absolutely patently clear. Who could possibly misunderstand it? And then you send it out in the world, and then it gets misunderstood all over the place. Uh, you know, so I just, um, I just went through that with a play of mine. I mean, I thought it was patently clear what what, what my characters were about. Um, no, people come in and they interpret, and sometimes you go, "Wow, that's great! I never thought of that before." And yeah, sometimes I mean, you go, yeah. "Ow!" Sometimes it's "Wow," and sometimes it's "Ow." I mean, I I I have I have been around one one truly great director who was Nick Heitner from uh, who directed Miss Saigon and that was an extraordinary experience and I learned you know an enormous amount from that but I was as likely to uh, be trying to explain a joke <laughs> to a director who doesn't tell me who doesn't get that it's funny you know um, what what can you do when when, uh, when they don't get it you know um, that's a that's the name of a book. What can you do when they don't get it? Yeah, right. So. Uh, but that that was it. I mean, I never really, I never wanted to write a musical. But I I started and I wrote a musical in prep school, and uh, I found somebody who could write the book, and uh, and I had a, a composer, but nobody wanted to write the lyrics, so I wrote the lyrics, and then I went to Yale, and we wrote two musicals there. I met David Shire, and. and uh, um, once again, um, for the musical to exist, I had to write it. And pretty soon I was the, uh, the lyricist and writer of, of the show. And when I came to New York, uh, no one was much interested in a book writer. 
Uh, but David and I were, were sort of popular uh, for, for songwriters. And I realized I was a lyric lyricist. And I thought, I didn't want to be a lyricist. <laughs> that amazes me. That astonishes me. I have no interest in being a lyricist. The, the lyricist sits in the hotel room trying to fix those two bad lines. Well, know? that's exactly what, what occurred to me when you were saying this, because I know, you, I know you first as a lyricist, and I understand the correlation between uh, the book writer and the director. Both are involved in shaping, shaping a show. Both have to be aware of dramatic art. Both have to uh, just understand every moment of the show. The lyricist seems seem to be a little bit not in that same uh, equation as lyric uh, librettist and and director uh, I, and I, and also I'm, let it let it be say, say, uh, said so that everybody in the room knows this not everybody directs their own work and not everybody is, is able to direct their own work um you there has to be a caution about that no you know, in fact i am completely schizophrenic on that on that count uh, if i am if i'm directing someone in singing a song that i wrote I'm an, as likely to say, now that's an interesting line. Why is that there? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I mean, it, it, it's kind of surprising. Uh, it seems the, the process of writing is one thing that's sort of like channeling the character and putting it down on paper. Um, um, but then looking at it just as a thing that's on paper, it suddenly takes on a different kind of life. And, uh, and I'm quite comfortable being two different people about that um you know and then looking at the at the words on the paper and thinking now that's an interesting thought why would why is that there and and literally not knowing what the answer is um um and then trying to figure out what it is with the actor and pretty soon we come up with something um, and i would imagine in, in in most cases if not all cases uh eventually it clarified for you why you had that impulse when you were writing it to put that yeah, line yeah, there. That, that's true. I mean, uh, to, to me, the writing, I mean, and, and as a lyricist, I am, uh, my, my lyrics are tend to be book oriented anyway. So, uh, so they are an extension of the storytelling, uh, always anyway, but, um, you know, you kind of, you know, the character, you know, the situation, the, you, sometimes uh, David and I, work over the music first and we'll have the music and the title and everything. And then I go off and, and, and hammer out the, the lyric and it's, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, but, uh, what, what, uh, what it is is that you kind of, the, the, the character kind of speaks, there's the music, the character talks, there's the music and, and pretty soon you find phrases in which the, Thing that you want to say corresponds to the music that's there and the interesting quirks that David gives me in the in the music, so that it becomes a kind of a dialogue, and then you write it down. And I'm as just as amazed when I look down and see what has actually been written on the page uh, as anybody, because I don't write it. I don't sit and write. I write down what I think. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I I'm gave just you, as surprised about it, you know. I, yeah, I gave you a compliment about um, life story, um, and you said to me, "You didn't write that. Somebody just told it to you, and you you wrote down you wrote down what that, she told you." That's exactly right. I was um, a, a woman, a, an old girlfriend of David's, came to me for advice on a benefit she was doing, and we had talked for a while. And as she was going out the door, I said, "Oh, and you know, how has it been with you?" And she turned and basically told me the entire point, the, everything that's in that song. Including, and I'm not complaining, but I'm not complaining. Including, I'm not complaining. Um, okay. And I, I, you know, I mean, I recognize that the phrase was there. I recognize that the rhyme scheme was there. I recognize the, uh, the, the power of the story she was telling. The only thing that she didn't tell me was, um, was the sex life part of it. I took that from some other friend, uh, you know. <laughs> it's an extraordinary lyric. Richard, it truly is an extraordinary. Well, lyric. Be, because it has the, 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 the logic of truth. It doesn't have the logic of writing. You know, um, it. it I want everybody to write that down. The it, logic it, of truth, not the logic of writing. 
Well, you know, you 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 write. Um, that's why I say I don't really write. I I write down. You know, I write down what 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 it. You know, and I look at the page, and then I look down at what I've written, and then I go over it again, and then fix it and correct it, and you know, um, change a word or two, or change the whole line or or something. But um, and that gets worked over. But the basic impulse is is um, um, is psychic, and uh, I mean literally psychic. Well, it's a good thing that your inner your inner workings, your inner inspiration, has such a <laughs> such a knack for this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what you what you what you channel um, just is sometimes so so thrilling and so amazing. Um, I, I want to go to the to back, not back to, but I want to introduce the specific idea of collaboration because uh, we talked about the fact that as a writer who also directs or as a director who lets yourself write sometimes, uh, you're collaborating with yourself in a sense. Um, can you talk about some of the collaborations that you've had as a writer with other directors? Um, I know that you've indicated that sometimes they just didn't get the joke. But, yeah. Um, what were the good things and what were the bad things? And, and what are the advantages and the disadvantages for you working with yourself without a collaborator? Well, the, I mean, on, on the simplest level, uh, I do know where the where the rhythms are. I do know what the inner thought is. I do know what the impulse is behind it, which very often is not what the words seem to be about. Um, as in any good dialogue, there is a subtext which usually runs counter to what the actual words are someone says i'm so happy and 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 the and the subtext of it i hate you and i don't ever want to see you again you know because that's that's playwriting uh, you well, know and well, so well, the, I, way, the I, way i've heard it phrased is it's it's what it's it's a it's a matter of figuring out what are people what are people saying when they're trying to achieve what they're trying to achieve uh, yes, exactly so. That is, and and what they're saying may not may not be a, in any way an indication of what what's what's truly going on. And all great plays get to a do that go through a scene, and then you find out what's really going on in that scene that just was there. Um, and um, um, that's the whole magic of withholding information, which was, which we it, do which we do all the time. It was interesting because I I. Uh, uh, this show that that we did on Monday, which is a restoration comedy, uh, is a musical here, version of the Country Wife for those of you who didn't, who didn't the, see the, it. Yeah, the Witcherly restoration comedy. But years ago, uh, David and I were driving across country, and we we I wanted to go to the Guthrie Theater, which I'd never seen, and so we got there at you know quarter to eight and went in to see whatever was playing, and what was playing was The Way of the World, which is a Congreve restoration comedy, uh, starring um, Zoe Caldwell, and um, not bad. The big, the big scene is, which is called the 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 proviso scene, which is with these two the the two lovers, the main two lovers, um, agree to that they will be lovers if on the proviso that you don't do this, and on the proviso that you don't act that way. And, and so it's a con it's a, a dissection of the games people play in affairs and and how uh, they agree that they will be lovers, but only on condition that they don't do any of these terrible things. They do this scene. It's a famous scene. It's funny. It's 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 delightful um, and very verbal and very controlled. And when the scene was over. And the guy leaves. And Zoe Calder was on the stage by herself. She went. <laughs> she had clearly been sitting. She was so hot for this guy. She couldn't keep her hands off of him. But she had played the whole scene as if as if it was all just intellectual. I that was when I understood acting. That's when I understood playwriting. That's when I understood um, restoration comedy, certainly of the whole premise of people saying things um, that are, are the opposite of what they think. And in Absolutely. fact, all, 
all of ain't misbehaving is based on that same joke um uh people not saying what they not know it telling the truth to each other um you finally told the, me what arthur with arthur Fari was trying to let me know like 40 years ago I had I, asked you this. I, I said, I was told that there was a subtext to ain't misbehaving that a lot of people didn't realize. So, yes, there is. So this is it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a defense mechanism. It's a, it's a way of protecting yourself against being hurt. Um, you know, so if you, if you don't commit, if you don't say, for example, I love you to somebody, then you then you are protected against somebody rejecting you, uh, you know. So to protect yourself against it, you say, uh, "Well, uh, you know, you're you're perfectly nice, but if you want that pretty little thing across the street, you can go get her." You know, uh, doesn't matter to me. Um, and and Waller's comedy is almost always contradictory to what what he's singing. So. Um, and I, I sort of recognize that. And the whole show is sort of based on on not telling the truth to to whoever you're singing with. Yeah, basically, uh, to put it bluntly, if you have your characters saying exactly what they're trying to achieve, it's usually doesn't make for very interesting theater. It's it's how uh, they well, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's how how they cover up what they really want. And I mean, how it's they all, it, it's almost the definition of playwriting. Yeah. I mean, uh, the simplest de definition of it. Um, it's what's so, you know, stunning in, in Steve Sondheim's lyrics. You know, there's always something else going on. Let me um, get my hat and my knife. What was yeah. that? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so collaboration, let's go back to collaboration again, because I think this is a, a key. Uh, I think it's a key thing that's of interest and of use to everybody in, in the room and actually anybody in theater. Well, you you asked about co collaboration. David and I met uh, as as freshmen at at, at Yale, and uh, and we've been working together ever since. Uh, we probably have the longest collaboration, certainly of anybody you know operating right now, uh, and possibly you know over. I mean, it'd be interesting to compare it to other collaborations, but um, well, it seems uh, to be the least <laughs> bloody of any of them. <laughs> well, somebody asked how. How it managed to uh, to you know last for so long, and I thought about it, and I thought, and and what came out was um, the we we never say it has to be my idea. A collaboration is over the moment one person says it has to be my idea. Um, we either I convince him, or he convinces me. Or if we are at, at loggerheads, at I can't I can't see his position, he can't see mine. We probably are asking the wrong question, and then we go back and define, redefine the whole process because probably uh, we're both wrong. That there's something else that we're missing, and we find that. But the moment that one of you says, "Shut up! It has to be my way," the collaboration is over. And, it's never uh, it's never it's never said that directly but it's there are many talk about subtext yeah i mean but it you know but it sometimes does happen that way and and writing is writing is very personal writing comes from your own vision of things and if somebody has a different vision of it that's annoying and um and if that well, happens well, let's say from the start client. though richard that you and david must have a shared aesthetic to some degree uh, it, it just you're it's just seamless the, the work that you do together um yeah uh, uh, i mean when we met uh, uh david didn't know anything about musicals i mean he came in have, having written in buffalo a a score to a musical it had ballads and comedy songs and dance numbers and and everything else it had no book no story no characters or anything but it was the score of a musical and he really thought we were going to, you know, he was going to find somebody who was going to write the musical that was going to go with the score. Um, and uh, and in, a, in a funny way, I sort of taught him how to write a song, which was interesting since I didn't know how to write a song, but I knew what he was doing was wrong. And so, you know, I would, I would 
invent these rules that I would <laughs> tell tell them. And and, and uh, there, a big breakthrough happened when we were writing uh, an adaptation of Cyrano de Bergerac, writing the song that ended up being Autumn, the one that's in in Closer Than Ever. Hmm. Um, we left in Autumn, and, yeah. And uh, uh, I I was badgering him about the different melodies that he'd written and why they didn't work. And, and he got so angry at me that he sort of came in and sort of here, fuck you, here's a melody. And he played it. And, and I said, yeah, David, that's it. <laughs> because, it, you know, it was, it was perfect. I, it, the only thing that I did was uh, he had a bridge that had a bunch of notes. And I said, why don't you hold the note over that? And that was the only change I made in it. But that was the the breakthrough when he followed his impulse, and he took his impulse, his musical impulse, and combined it with all of the things I was telling him, and uh, and from there on, we just you know, then he started to explode. Then once he crossed that line, the stuff that came out of him was absolutely breathtaking. I mean. We played through the score of the first off-Broadway show that we wrote in New York called uh, The Sap of Life. Only ran, you know, six weeks, but um, I had occasion, we did record it, and I had occasion to listen to the recording, and I hadn't listened to it in, you know, 40 years. And um, I listened to it, and I thought, good Lord, we wrote this in the early 60s. This was the This was in the days of Julie Stein and Richard Rogers and um, and David was writing these spectacular piano parts, so breathtaking that even that now when he listens to them he can't believe he actually wrote them. But they his piano playing was so stunning, um, and um, uh, I thought that maybe that was the reason why why we were. Um, attracting attention i mean it didn't, i didn't think at the time that it was so extraordinary but listening to it i thought oh my god it must have just blown people's minds and it sort of did i mean um the show got sort of mediocre reviews it got a, it got actually very pleasant reviews but not not anything that would make anybody want to go to see it um, um but in the second week of the run uh steve sondheim came to see it and then Several days later, he came back and brought Jerry Robbins. And then several weeks after that, he brought Bernstein and, and Hal Prince um, all to hear, I thought, the score. Um, and uh, I asked him about it. And he said, yes, yes, David's music was breathtaking, but I also liked the lyrics. <laughs> and he said, he actually said, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't quote one of those, lo a, a, that a particular line from the show and I said to myself Steve Sondheim quotes a show a line from the sap of life I'm my life my I'm a success <laughs> yeah we I, we all love for that moment congratulations on that though um well I I didn't mean to be so you know self-congratulatory but it no, was no, it's, it was, it was, was uh, but it was uh it was I mean who knew that David the David who hmm. arrived as a freshman at Yale was going to turn into this world-class composer. Um, and uh, uh, Well, on some level, you knew. So. Well, I, I didn't. We didn't start working because I liked his writing. I, we started working together because we were the only game in town. I, he was the composer, and I wanted to write musicals, and... We looked around desperately to find somebody else we could work with. There was nobody else. We were stuck with each other. Scott Sublet wants to know what was the line that Sondheim quoted. Oh, we all um, we all want to know that. Uh, it, it it was a, from a song called uh, um, uh, a, a, a Charmed Life. Uh, uh, a, a boy is sent off by his family to. Uh, so is wild oats in the big city and his younger brother runs runs away from home to go and be with him and the younger brother sings while plucking the plums out of the tree flip a few pits back to me i don't know why that should attract anybody's attention but that was the one he quoted so 
Well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, let's let's expand the conversation a little bit because uh, you've you've collaborated with other people as well. Um, as far as I know from from talking to you so far, you've you've never uh, let's see, you've never just written lyrics for anything. I think you you've you've either written book and book and lyrics or you've written the book uh, or uh, like fix the book or I, I don't know what your process has been with Miss Saigon and, and all of the other shows well, that no, you. Well, Miss Saigon, I was solely the, the, the co-lyricist. I, I mean. Um, oh, you were the co-lyricist. Oh yeah. The, the, I, I worked with Alain Boublil who had written it in French. They, their style, their technique is that they write the show in French first. And, um, and, they had structured the show. Um, uh, it it didn't have any English words, but it but it, it was it was pretty much laid out, and that layout remained pretty much the same. But within the scenes, as scenes, there they they weren't uh, they weren't very interesting pieces of playwriting as scenes. They they tended to be kind of clunky. They tended to be very obvious. Um, and um, there wasn't any kind of playwriting going on. Um, and uh, so uh, what Alan and I did was we would go off to a hotel in some exotic and rather beautiful place, like on the coast of Brittany or something. And uh, we'd spend two or three weeks there and come out with half of an act um, <clears throat> or um, either half of the first act, second half of the first act or the second act, those three parts. Um, and um, what we did was we s took the music that was there and then reconstructed the story so that this, there was an actual scene going on in an action that involved a scene. And um, um, so to some extent, I guess you are right. We uh, was um, writing the, what I thought we, what we did was we wrote a play. We wrote a musical play with a pre-existing yeah. score, um, and uh, you know, with all sorts of variations that Claude Michel didn't expect. Oh, sorry, you got muted. Uh, you got muted for some somehow. Okay, there you go. How much of yeah. that did you hear? Um, I think we you got as far as, as uh, there was something about us. You got up to the story. Um, oh well, we 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 basically um, uh, wrote the uh, we we wrote a play uh, to with that storyline and with with the music pretty much laid out, but uh, we assigned lines differently. Um, broke songs up into into dialogue moments and and uh, and basically made sure that something happened in each scene. Uh, so so you, this is this is Miss Saigon, right? You're, you're, this is Miss Saigon. So, yeah. so essentially, you you did you did get involved in the in the book writing on that as well. Yeah, I, 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 I now that you mention it, yes, we the the lyric process of that show was was uh, was a was a script writing process. Um, it it had it had it fell into rhymed couplets. It fell into rhymes and and songs, but it was entirely a a, a script writing process. The one uh, collaboration that I know about because I knew the collaborator was you collaborated with Arthur Farr. You collaborated with a cho choreographer to some degree. Uh, what was the, that collaboration like in in Ain't Misbehaving? Uh, well. Um, uh, it, 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 I mean, it, the uh, the structure of the show was mine. Uh, uh, I knew. Listen, I went into rehearsal with a stack of sheet music and f the cast and five good ideas. This and is a Manhattan weeks, Theater Club. Yeah, and four weeks later, we we came out with a with a show. So it was it was all done on its feet. Arthur was in fact. Um, not available during the first week because um, 
he was directing, he was uh, choreographing a tour of South Pacific that he was committed to. So uh, um, I, he was turning down the show and I said, well, what hour, you look, you're free in the evenings, aren't you? Yes. And what's your day off? Or you? Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll take that. And, uh, and we, we, we worked it out. I, I would sort of block out the scenes and then he um, added this stunning vocabulary of movement that um, was made up 50% of his knowledge of Harlem dance styles and 50% of his training. He's the only, at that time, was the only American dancer ever to be trained by the Royal Ballet of Thailand. Um, and so the, the, that, the Royal Thai Ballet and all of this, that's part of the ain't misbehaving style, ain't misbehaving, I'm saving my love for you. That's not Harlem. That's, that's, that's Thai. And, uh, all of the all of the the hand movements added to to uh you know it, this would have been you know um harlem moves uh but instead it was that it added this incredible elegance to the show it was an invention of an entirely of of a, of a, a very eloquent um uh movement style that no show had ever had and it came largely out of, uh, again, describing, uh, um, focusing on uh, the nature of, of Fats Waller and, the, and, and style concealing things. So this is all about how I am so cool. I am so elegant. I am so much better than you are, you know. Uh, and you may think that you are better than me, and I think you're better than me, but I'll never let you know that, you know. Um, we're back to the Fats Waller subtexts. We're back to the Fats Waller subtext. It built on watching what Waller was doing and listening to what he was doing in his comedy and finding ways of turning that into a show. That's the secret ingredient of, of uh, I mean, this behavior. So I think if I, if I, if I uh, have heard you correctly, Shire wrote music, the music first. The music did it always come first? Did you ever write a lyric first? Sometimes I did. I tended to write doggerel. I tended to write very boring things, and he would then set it, and it would be very boring. Uh, and I would finally say, "Oh, you know, now you know what I'm talking about. Go write something." And and he would go off and write something that was way better, way more quirky. Way more interesting. And what, what's interesting about his music is that he does. He goes to strange places. He doesn't. He doesn't follow. You know, certain kinds of of conventional logic. I find that fascinating because I find that I find that there's a parallel in human speech that can follow that logic because we tend to talk that way. We tend not to talk in 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 uh, standard forms. So I, I found. I a collaborator of mine, a composer, uh, Scott Oakley, uh, used to talk about uh, Richard Rogers uh, with great respect. Um, and he used to say that R Rogers had a, a, a genius for going to the wrong note. Uh, <laughs> yes, right. So, so but uh, David not only goes to the wrong note, he goes to the, uh, into the unexpected. He twist. goes into the unexpected place and the unexpected twist. And it's, 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 um, um, you know, whenever he does that, I would jump out of my chair and, and have to be sort of walking around the room. Uh, we always knew that if it got me out of my chair, it was good. <laughs> this is a new standard we can all apply now. Okay. Yes, right. <laughs> it, that, can I, if I could sit still while he was playing it, yeah, you know. Um, the the uh, only other person I know of that you wrote, wrote with was Charles Strauss, but I'm sure there were others. Um, can you talk about some of your other collaborations? Well, not too many. I mean, I did a, a bunch of industrial shows with Johnny Morris. Um, you know, he wrote Green, uh, Green Was My Valley and uh, 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 the the musical of that. He, he didn't have as successful a career no. in the theater as he wanted, but he had a huge career because he was the the go to. Um, Composer for Mel Brooks for most of most of his movies. Didn't know that. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and he 
he's a very, very funny, you know, delightful person, delightful writer. And uh, he and I wrote several, you know, delightful, I mean, kind of grand industrial shows. There used to be these things called industrial shows, ladies and gentlemen. Loved them, loved them. Uh, businesses would put would would hire the top people, pay them a lot of money to do a show introducing this year's line of Buicks, you know. And and David did one show for Buick that, that had four companies and four band, four orchestras, and all rehearsing in a in a in an airline in an airplane hangar someplace. And David was one of the conductors and Jonathan Tunick was one of the conductors. And I think, um, anyways, it was that kind of, that kind of thing. And that um, was one but, of the ways that people made a living back then. Oh yeah. I, I mean, we, we, I did a, a, a big, uh, industrial show for, for general electric for the, the audience was a relatively small audience of the CEOs of the biggest power companies in the United States. And, um, uh, that's a relatively big, small audience. <laughs> I, I mean, it was a small, but, you know, unbelievably powerful uh, group. And and we had dancers. We had Dorothy Loudon. Dorothy Loudon was starring in it, um, for which I, I I will tell you, I do like this one. She 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 was carried out by four dance boys uh, as Cleopatra on, up in a song about power. And she said, when daddy died, they came to me, a helpless, untrained sparrow. They told me, you rule Egypt now. And I said, me a pharaoh? I like that. <laughs> anyway. Oh, gosh. All right. <laughs> but, I um, mean, you could do that because you could, you know, there was no standard. You just had to make the audience laugh and it would disappear the next day. It was, it was, you know, like, yeah, there, were, there was a lot of outrageous stuff being done in, in industrials. I've, I've seen uh, films of them. I'm, uh, and actually, sure. I've, I may have attended one or two back then. There was a famous one called the Millican show. The Millican show. Absolutely. It was done. Fabric, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a breakfast show and all the, every top choreographer did one and um, all the dancers in New York did them. Um, it was, you know, they were amazing things. So uh, let me ask about, <laughs> she said, changing the subject. Let me ask you about Nick and Nora. Um, that was a situation where, where you actually had a, another collaborator, Charles Strauss. Did he also write the music first? Did he, it was the music first for that? Or how um, did you, how, what was your collaboration like with, with a different person? Um, he did. Um, and uh, Charlie, uh, is um is a music machine i mean he sits down and he can write 12 perfectly shaped songs in 12 minutes i mean it just you know yikes um he's he's if, if anything he's uh he's so facile that it's almost a problem um because uh they're all good but what is you know how do you where do you find the one that's exceptional um, and then also he had a really bad habit of then rewriting something that he had written very quickly and improving it. But in the interim, I would have written the lyric to the first one and then I'd come in and I would do the lyric and I'd say, oh yeah, but I rewrote the melody. I said, you can't, but you, I just spent a week doing uh, I, I had him um, on a panel once. Uh, he described his process as misremembering other people's music. Well, I, I, it's it's very possibly true. I mean, I uh, no, he said he, that. I remember he said it on the panel. No, I mean, uh, it's probably not only a quip, but it's also probably true. Um, he he does. He writes uh, in in a theatrical genre that is recognizable, um, and uh, he's he does do fresh things in 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 the in the course of it. But then, his biggest success which is tomorrow is the most extraordinary piece of writing i mean no melody does any of the things that that melody does um it it goes up and down in ways it, it why would a melody start down that's a weird melody uh, you know 
and then it, and then the bridge goes off and and then it goes off into uh, into the stratosphere at the end and there's the structure is so fresh and inventive it's also true that he didn't write it for Annie. Oh, really? <laughs> no, it was a trunk song. <laughs> he had written it for um, an industrial show or something like. He was lying around. That's the other thing with with Charlie. He will he will uh, uh, he will um, say, "Oh, I have I have a melody." It goes like this because <laughs> he has so many other melodies that come that come along. No, I call it Charlie. To go back to Dick and Nora, though, because I, I I should know more than I do. Uh, did you did you do the book and lyrics from that, or was there a book writer? Oh dear, no, I couldn't. I no, it was Arthur Lawrence. Okay, so you wrote with Arthur Lawrence. So let's talk about that for a second. Why? I mean, uh, uh, no. The thing is that because I'm sure uh, that everybody would love to hear. He was going to. He was going to be the director. It was probably, It was the the people who had been behind. The production of um, La Caja Fall, which he had directed, um, wanted to do something else, and 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 had the idea of doing uh, the Thin Man, um, and uh, so Arthur was going to direct it. Uh, Pete Gurney, A. R. Gurney, was going to be their book writer. Uh, um, Charlie, uh, Buddy Strauss, was going to be the music, and and. Uh, and they came eventually to me. I don't think I was their first choice, but um, and I had been wanting to write with Pete Gurney for a long time, so I was really happy to get together, and that I thought that would be wonderful. But we barely had like two or three meetings when Arthur started coaching Pete on how to write the scenes, and Pete finally said, "You know, Arthur, why don't you just write them? You know what you want." And he left. So suddenly I was there with Arthur Lawrence, who is both the book writer and the director, and talk about not having a not having an editor in, in the in the collaborator process. Uh, Arthur, the director, gave in to Arthur the writer all the time. And Arthur the writer did not write a did not write a story. And, Just out of uh, curiosity, Richard, did did you, as as somebody who also was in that same position many times, uh, book writer and and uh, director, did you like recognize things, or did you did you learn things from from that experience that you took with you? Well, I learned things painfully. Yes, uh, um, uh, I um, we did a a reading at one point, and I wrote this, you know, I don't know, eight page letter about why the story wasn't a story and why it what had to happen um and it and arthur read that and thought and his his takeaway from that letter was richard just wants to direct the show and um the truth of the matter is the last thing i wanted to do was direct this show <laughs> that show i wouldn't have touched with a you know 20 foot pole and uh um you know, I, and so he didn't pay any attention to the to the things. He did not write a story that made any sense. Uh, he had some wonderful, wonderful creative ideas that didn't go anywhere. He thought, for example, that the mystery, the actual murder mystery part of the Thin Man stories was minor. Um, and in fact, that the audience didn't care about it. True. They didn't care about it, but it was there. There is a, the device of the thin man, which is that a fat man and a skinny man have the same skeleton, um, is, uh, is an actual murder mystery um, revelation. It's a, it's a, a, a thing that Dashiell Hammett came up with. You got uh, to work with one of my favorite people in the whole world, uh, Joanna Gleason. Oh yeah, well she's wonderful. The cast was spectacular. I mean, yeah. we had Christine Baranski, we had Deborah Monk, we had um, Chris Sarandon, we had uh, I'm leaving out all sorts of people. Um, Tom Sesma was in it. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Faith Prince, of course, the big you know her big turn. Um, and uh, 
-hmm. the cast was the cast was wonderful. Oh, Barry Bostwick, of course, was was Nick, and um, uh, but they they were working so hard to make it make sense, and it never did. I'm not sure that the score helped. I mean, I you know we I didn't. I don't think that we solved the thing. What what did what it did have was we had three big numbers which were solving you know detective work numbers in which the two of the two of them are trying to figure out if this happened then that must have happened, but that couldn't have happened because that happened. So therefore, something else must have happened, and that was done in a big in in two big concerted numbers um, that were fresh and and uh really interesting um uh and theatrically very inventive um arthur didn't care much about the the um the book writing aspect of those sequences so when it was finished when each sequence was over as opposed to taking something that had been learned from the sequence and moving on um um it uh uh he just sort of went on with what the story he had and uh um, well, well historically so, i mean you, i don't have, i don't mean to put you through the pain of this but historically we just know that it didn't it wasn't working and and uh, it was notorious for not being successful it was notorious for being the longest the show in previews that at the time the show it had six oh. weeks of previews and no show had ever had that and then when Spider-Man was coming on, I thought perhaps everybody had forgotten Ms. Nick and Nora, but Spider-Man was like, well, it's the, it's going to be as long as Nick and Nora. Oh, it's longer than Nick and Nora. Oh, it's way longer than Nick and Nora. Nick and Nora previously was the longest show. I well, you're in, the, you're in the history books. Shut up. I just. <laughs> you made it to the history leave books. Us, leave us in peace. Um, well, back to the to the cross your process because uh, I'm clear on the fact that that David or uh, whatever whoever you were writing with normally uh, you prefer if they give you the music first and then you write the lyrics. Well, and in truth, to, that's not even with David and me. At least at the beginning, um, he would write the music. We'd have the we'd talk about the idea of the song. The idea always preceded. Okay. It. Sometimes I'd write a couplet or a you know a title or something like that. Um, he would then go off and write it. And, and then we would work over the music, the two of us. And we would, you know, should it go to that note? Should it go to that? Maybe it needs a little thing on it. Maybe it needs something else. Until the music, until I felt that the music was, uh, was totally saying what the content of the song was supposed to be. It was in the music. Then I would go off and just try to find the language that was already in it. I always likened it to Michelangelo saying that the statue is in the stone. I just cut away the unnecessary parts. Um, right. um, I felt completely specifically that the melody was saying what the song had to say. And I just had to find the language for it. So uh, back to process at this point, did the book already exist or did, did you also create books and develop the book while you were writing the songs? Well, to some extent, uh, we would do that. Uh, um, where we had problems were with songs like, um, with shows like Baby, where it really needed uh, an instinct from somebody other than me. Um, it, it needed a woman, really. Um, and... Uh, so we started, uh, we talked to uh, a talented playwright named Susan Yankowitz. Uh, I remember and, Susan. Yeah, and then, uh, and then finally we came to Sybil Pearson, uh, and uh, she was the person who we sort of waited for. And, and uh, you know. At what uh, point in the process did you write The Story Goes On? Because that's an amazing song. It's and about it, about, about halfway it, through it, I guess. Da David, we we knew that 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 would be the moment. What you know, the quickening when the kick first comes. Uh, and uh, again, David, uh, David didn't write that melody for the show. That he had that was a it was a melody he had. 
uh, didn't have the pul- the heartbeat. It didn't have some of the details in it, but um, he had that. And I said, uh, don't you dare give it to anybody else. <laughs> don't you dare use it in a movie. Because he was a big Hollywood writer at the time. Yeah, Nor- Nor- Norma Ray. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, but we had that. And, and the melody seemed to be absolutely perfectly saying what it was supposed to say. The problem was to find words that would also correspond to it. And so well, this I, is the I, tale I, I my listen, mother told me, you know, the tale. I listened to this song, Richard, I listened to this song very recently. I saw it performed by a, a, an entire woman's choir. And uh, I was, I, I am a guy. So I, you know, I have, you know, I have that, that problem in talking in terms of talking about this, but I thought that it was a really compelling and honest uh, lyric that I thought very accurately communicated the woman's point of view. I, I, I and watching the performance by the women in the choir, they were they seemed to be so moved by it and so fully uh, committed to it that I I, I think you did something um, pretty wonderful with that. I I think so, I mean, but I must say it, it was uh, when I was working on it, I couldn't believe that was the way that that the song was going to start. So this is the tale of my, but it's had to start with the impulse, you know, it had to start with an emotional response to just the simple fact of something happening. Um, Perception precedes understanding. And most songs, the first that most songs or a lot of songs uh, start with a, perception of something and then an understanding follows i've often walked down the street before but the pavement ever oh my goodness i guess something's happened i guess i must be in love you know it, it is is the so so this is the tale my so this is what it is oh and this is the feeling and the, when she was talking about that she was talking about this oh my goodness i understand my mother for the first time and now if I understand that, I also understand what she must have understood. What I've understood is that I'm I'm not alone. I'm part of a great chain of life. I mean, it, 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 the, the thought pro- follows from the perception. Um, and, and just I mean, as a technical point for, for lyricists in the room, if, who will probably know this anyway, this is all, this is very much addressing the whole situation of you mustn't start this the song your song with the ending a lot, yeah. many, many of us write songs that that were were there already in the first line and oh uh, yeah to... i mean and 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 conventional pops popular songs uh don't you know they sort of give away where they're going to go rather rather early the difference with a theater song is that it 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 doesn't give away where it's going at all and and um and then surprises you so I I love I'm going to add that to my repertory of things that I talk about in our workshop. So you're saying that basically perce- perception, had, say it again, perception. Perception precedes understanding. Uh, precedes understanding. I that, I uh, that's you know, incredibly useful. It it is you. It's uh, oh my lord, the the sky is blue and I'm feel and and it's such a happy day and I'm. And I don't understand why I'm feeling so gloomy. Um, oh, it must be that something has happened, and therefore, it doesn't matter whether there's a blue sky. I'm going to feel gloomy no matter what, because oh, because I've just been abandoned by my lover, and I'm never going to see that. You know, and and my life is actually going to end. But it starts with the perception. So it's, it's basically like we always tell everybody a song has to have a dramatic arc yeah exactly and it, but the dramatic arc comes from a sensation that leads to understanding of the sensation autumn it feels like autumn although the breeze is still i feel, feel the chill of autumn oh yes it's autumn it's always autumn however green the hill to me it still is autumn i can feel the frost now and then it gets to the end uh, he left in autumn and though another season's here i feel the emptiness of autumn all the, all the year because you follow the thought process through to the ending. Um, and, and you can take 
you know, almost any theater song in, in one way or another, it does that. Um, well, also, I mean, uh, another example that everybody uses is If I Love You, If I Loved You. It's a song mm -hmm. that talks about the possibility. And as the song goes on, the possibility becomes more and more real to the people that are that are singing this song. Um, but look where, look where the song goes. Longing to tell you, but afraid and shy, I let my golden I'd let my golden chances pass me by. Soon you'd leave me. Off you would go in the mist of day. Never, never to know how I loved you. Oh, if I, if loved, I loved you. you. Yeah. But I mean, the the the. If I loved you, what would I do? I would feel this. If I loved you, I would feel that. And then it goes to, and if I did, I would lose you. And you would never, ever know. And the song doesn't lead you to the dramatic ending, which is the kiss. The, she sings the second verse of that song, and it doesn't end with the end of the song. The song ends, and then, he, and then they, they, um, he, she, he, I, I'm not sure where, what, what, where he says, but he says, uh, she says, I'm not going to go back to the mill and I'm just going to stay here even if I get into trouble. And, and, um, and the kiss comes and the music rises on that. It doesn't rise on the song. The song doesn't end the scene, which is interesting. Well, that's a whole uh, combination of song and scene that the, 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 the what are they called? The bench, the bench, scene. the bench scene. It's the bench yeah. scene. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which also includes Mr. Snow, I mean, which is, you know. It's complex. I mean, musical theater writing is not as simple as as it sometimes seems. No. Um, and uh, nobody wants any anybody to be self-consciously complicated, but if you just let things happen naturally and if you allow the drama to unfold. Um, well, what's interesting is that the lyric, and in, 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 he, he wrote the lyrics first, um, the lyric to Mr. Snow is a description of why, of, 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 of the silliness of that love story. You know, I mean, that young, seafarer and bold and daring, bewhiskered, over, overbearing, darling Mr. Snow. I mean, he's, he's a humorless, dull person, and I'm going to marry him. To which Richard Rogers wrote this glorious melody, so nobody ever notices what the content of that song is. The song is funny. The song is is um, essentially to be in contrast to "If I Loved You," which is real love. Well, um, Mr. Snow, here I am. Yeah, I mean, it just <laughs> you know, <laughs> then he'll set me on a feet and I'll say, "Kind of well, man, here I am," and then he'll kiss me and I'll know it. And it's all a fantasy that's just not going to happen for her. Carrie is not going to have the kind of love that Julie has. She's gonna have lots of kids and and everything else, but you know. So, this is why I love musical theater so very dearly. I mm -hmm. think it does it just does, does amazing things and and tells stories in an amazing way um, when it's when it's working, <laughs> when it's when it is working. Yeah, and it can work and then not work, and that you know, um, you can write wonderful things that then don't do what they're supposed to do, and then you can write wonderful things, and then they do. Uh, I guess I guess the reality is we don't we don't always know. I mean, there are ways of check, checking in to see if we're checking the right boxes, mm -hmm. but I guess there's always going to be that the, the magical element, element and what, whether it all falls into into place as we well, I, feel I it would, should. I, I've always felt that the 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 direction of a musical is the one of the complexities of the direction of a musical is um finding you have two completely uh contradictory impulses in order for it to in order for it to be creative and discover things you have to release it to go where it's going to go the actors have to find things you have to find things in the scene that you didn't think were there at the same time the directorial impulse has to be completely controlling and totally state that it's going to be this and then that and then that. But you have to do you have to do this kind of dance between complete control and complete release. Um, nothing for me ever happened 
in a show unless I released it to go where it was and I would just go, oh, isn't that interesting? Oh, oh yeah, let's, yeah, there it is. That's the answer. Um, and at the same time, the shows have to be completely, you know, organized. Music has to be organized and, um, and, uh, and, it, 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 and, and, and defined, so. I'm keeping you past the time that you said you could be here. Can, can I ask you another question or? or sure. You... Um, I, I, I had COVID, I'm not going anywhere. Okay. <laughs> I guess this goes back to the, the director versus the writer. And I don't mean to put verses there for any particular antagonistic reason, but how does the process for you as a director differ from you as the writer? You've touched on this, but can we, can we look at that a little bit more? Uh, the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because I don't want everybody to think that they can direct their own work because not everybody can. I, I, uh, I, I, I think that it is an an, um, an anomaly of the way that I create things. Um, um, I work on the script in exactly the same way that I work on the songs. That is to say, I sort of channel it. You know. Um, how to find an interesting way of playing a, a scene, what's really going on in the scene, what really is happening with this person and that person, why are they attracted to each other, why are they saying what they're saying, what's really going on in the scene. Um, but you also said that, that, that and, the director often finds a, finds a, word, a, a line and, and says, says to the writer, being the same person, why did, why, why did you do this? Why, why yeah, is it, well, that's, why is this I mean, that, But that's true. I, I, you know, and and you and you 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 answer that in whatever way is true. Uh, I don't, you know, um, uh, you you have to. Um, how, about, how can I say this? Um, the um, uh, the channeling process that produces a lyric that's interesting you know some strange line that you'd kind of are surprised that you that you wrote um that's equally true of the channeling process of that involves the shaping of a whole story uh you know i know that this is going to happen but how is this going to happen then and, and and um this person is a has a quirky personality, so it's not going to happen in the standard way. It's going to happen in a different way, and therefore that person's going to do something else, um, and that produces language. Sometimes it produces dialogue. Sometimes it produces a lyric, but it's the same. It's the same impulse. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Uh, it, well, you, it, what occurs to me is 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 that there's a conversation going on between instinct and intellect. Yes, exactly. So it's 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 following what is is following the sort of um, spiritual story, the the uh, uh, the story that has its own its own dynamic, and then controlling it with uh, the actual choice of lines and you know a sense of humor and wit. It you know um, um, does the character uh, have a sense of humor? Does it that character have a have the ability to say something uh, bold and directly in a way that no one else could could say it? Um, you know, and once you commit to that, the show starts talking. The shows one thing, talk. One thing that I that I that I often say is that the 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 art, art consists of two parts, which is creativity and communication. So the creative uh, process- I, I, That's fair, that's fair. The, the creative process basically is, is, an, is an impulsive, instinctive process. And then in order to communicate, you, you have to look at your work as if somebody that's not living in your mind is looking at it. And you have to yeah. find whether you're communicating what you think you're communicating. And and very often you don't have that doesn't happen until it gets in front of an audience and you realize they don't understand this, you know. Uh, I had that a little bit with the with the country wife because I think 
some people don't understand the conventions of a restoration comedy. Don't understand, they don't understand the terms of it. Um, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, which is a pl Plautus and which is a, you know, Greek comedy. They got away with because they translated it into the into the vocabulary of burlesque. I mean, um, because the Greek comedies are 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 bawdy and and um, and and uh, sexy and dirty and 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 lots of 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 uh, punchlines. That's burlesque, and so they you know cast a bunch of burlesque actors, and um, um, and you just knew what it was. Restoration comedy is a more is is a more intellectual style and. Um, uh, I, I think that in in a in a revision, I'd be a little bit clearer at the beginning of, of, of in terms of leading the audience into this world. Um, Which again is another basis basic thing that everybody who writes for musical theater needs to understand is that the opening of your show needs to lead the audience into the world. Uh, yeah. Needs to bring them into the world in a way that they they understand where they are and they understand what the rules are, the rules of storytelling are going to be as well. That's so, that's what Steve says. It's it's you know you have you have the opening 10 minutes to set the rules of the evening and sometimes it's the opening five minutes and um and then and and after that you're at the mercy of your own rules that's right yeah basically if you if you find that the, that the rest of the show isn't doing what you set up then you need to make a choice mm -hmm. something yeah. has to change one of the one or the other has to change. I mean, I saw I saw Forum at, in, in in New Haven when it opened. When it, Bef before before, it com before yeah. Comedy Tonight. Before Comedy Tonight, and it was the same show. It was funny, it was perfectly fine, but Comedy Tonight announced that it was funny, and and had this wonderful Robbins choreography to it. That, you know where they established the jokes, and then you got what it was. The rest of the show was pretty much exactly what it was. They didn't do very much changing to it. Um, well, it's considered but, one of the miracles if, miracles of musical theater that that suddenly when Comedy Tonight became the opening number, the show worked. Uh, yeah, said and, that it and, but that's the reason. But it was exactly that. The, the opening number told you uh, what the evening was going to be about and you relaxed into it. Whereas pre previously, with Love, Love is, is in, the, in air. the Air, I wasn't quite sure whether this was a romantic story or not. And we didn't now have permission to laugh really for a good long while. There wasn't anything funny. Even Pseudolus wasn't a major character of, for a few minutes. And, uh, you know, so. Well, this has been wonderful. Um, I've enjoyed this, enjoyed talking to you so much. Um, I do think I, that we, we both probably need to go get dinner. Yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed. So um, I just want to say to the room, uh, does anybody have anything that you wanted to ask Richard before before I close up shop? Um, you're gonna have to re respond quickly because I'm gonna go off and say my farewells to the YouTube audience. Okay, Susan Crawford, there I see there's a hand raised. Susan, what what did you want to ask? And uh, we have a pair of Susans. Can it, can anybody beat a pair of Susans? Anybody? <laughs> Two jacks, yes. Okay. Sue, you have to take yourself off, off, off mute. There are endless Susans in my generation. Here is my question. Um, we are about to open a musical to which everyone here is invited at Don't Tell Mama, January 8th. It is a classic book musical because when we first wrote it, that's what we knew. Since then, everything's gone very Hamilton-esque. And I'm just wondering what Mr. Malpy's opinion is on the, the place for classic book musicals in today's theater. I think that's uh, a that's fair a, question. It's a really interesting question. Of uh, um, there is a term called post dramatic writing. You know what that means? Um, um, I can I can put it together in my head, but uh, uh, post dramatic I mean, uh, dramatic writing is the standard thing where you 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 um, you go into a scene, the scene plays out. You go to another scene. The scene plays out at, uh, in a in a musical. There have been songs in it, and they play out. And it, but it goes fundamentally in the drama in the structural form of of a play. Um, more and more, 
as audiences become very, very sophisticated and they can recognize the sounds of that, um, there is a sort of an impatience to move the story faster. And the things that move the story faster are things like a narrator, um, things like talking to the audience, people, you know, things that break the wall or that tell the story differently. And Hamilton is a perfect example of post-dramatic writing. Where does it play place? What is that tavern that we're in? Who are those dancers? Um, what it is is that everything on the stage exists for the purpose of telling information uh, to communicate a story. And if you and and none of it, I mean, occasionally they kind of do a little bit of a scene and then they go right off of it. Some you know, but the the division between a, a narrative moment where we're telling information to the audience and playing a scene is hardly. There's hardly a, 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 um, a, a distinction between the two. Um, Burr and Hamilton have, oh. have, a, have an interesting little talk when they meet, but they immediately go off into, into other things as well. So uh, I really love post-dramatic writing. I love shows that, that, that uh, um, do that tell the story in a different way. There is something kind of tedious about a book scene that's been true for you know fifty years, um, and unless the scene is really really well written, it's it usually is a drag. So uh, um, being able to break that uh, is a uh, uh, is 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 something that's very refreshing and often leads to very interesting song forms and music forms and everything. Um, uh, I, I mean, Hamilton does so many rule-breaking things so effortlessly that it's just stunning. But you know, but uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice had one idea, one idea when they started out, which was that book scenes were boring. So they started writing shows that didn't have book scenes. Joseph the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat and uh, Superstar, and you know all of those early shows. Um, which went from song to song and told the story internally um, without, without any scenes. Um, and uh, that went on until by accident, he, he wrote uh, Phantom of the Opera, which was song after song, but also, and it was all sung, but it also was a conventional, had real scenes. And from then on, Andrew started writing shows that had uh, real books like Sun Sunset Boulevard, and he suddenly was back being a writer who had book problems. And all of his later work had book problems. Hmm. Okay, well, let's move to Sue Horowitz. Well, Sue, what, just, what was yeah, your I'm, question? Well, I don't know. I just wanted to say that I'm finding this all really interesting, and I'd like to view it again. And it, it, in fact, if there was even like any exercises like right of this, that does that, you know, that might be very challenging and fun. Like even even you take this, which is here's, a, you know, like a narrative scene. OK, now break it, you yeah. know, or well, take, interesting. yeah, it, you it, know, how can you, you anything like like that or hey what you the first thing you said which is where the subtext contradicts the words uh -huh. I, I mean that's that's a device that's a bmi device it's not one of yeah, mine yeah. but but i just do it automatically but but um uh we just finished a show that we did in, in bangkok called waterfall and the opening 10 minutes of the show um are um it there's a company of thai dancers and there are um, main characters who who move through it and tell their story, tell the backstory of the three main characters that ends up, and and it's entirely danced and it's depicted. Um, a, 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 each each character has a sort of a dance avatar that is dancing the version of the story that's being told, and the story is being told verbally. Um, and I'm very proud of that. I just think it's, you know, it's, it doesn't sound like any show that ever was, and I really like it, so. Yeah. 
I was well, going to end now. I was going to end now, but uh, Ross tells me there's other questions in the chat. So Ross, what are the other two questions so we can? So I'm starved. I want to make dinner. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, Natalie said, "Ask him to dinner and invite me," which I think was a joke. Then there are <laughs> other questions. Uh, how do you choose which shows to direct if you aren't the lyricist? Well. First of all, I don't, I'm not offered a lot of shows, so I don't choose them. <laughs> I mean, mostly the shows that I direct are shows that I've, are self-generated. So there really isn't that, that issue. Um, I did uh, a show called The Story of My Life, which I was just the director of. Oh, yes. Mostly I'm not, you know. It's an absolutely lovely show. And, That's a two-character uh, one, right? Yeah, two-character show. Yeah. Um, um, and um, but mostly, mostly. The, well, the other the other one was big, which had uh, which was directed by Mike Ockrent, um and choreographed by Stroman. And it was just uh, I mean, I love them. Abs I love them both um, so much, but um, I wasn't sure that Mike. Uh, it, it, Mike knew how to do knew how to do a joke show. He really knew how to do. That's what me and my girl was. That's what uh, Crazy for You was. You know, a, a standard, um, old fashioned musical with with book scenes and jokes. Real and and he was brilliant at it. Um, Big was a little show that re that required heart. It was all about feeling, and um, that was never enough. That never re really grabbed him, and I think that was one of the reasons why the show didn't. Uh, he should. He should have started with stop time. Well, yeah, exactly. So, I mean that 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 wasn't that wasn't an impulse that was um, uh, an afterthought. It was sort of central to the emotional feeling of. I mean, the show is about what would happen if you have a chance to skip over the horrible teens, you know. What happens if everybody, when they hit their teens, would like to go past it because it's so heartbreaking. <laughs> and this kid is given the chance to skip over the pain and discovers at the end that you just can't do that. You, you, have, to, you have to go back and have all the pieces of your life, including the bad parts, um, if you're going to grow up, if you're going to be a grown up, you know. And uh, Ross, anything else? Yes. Uh, what attracts you to a project? Um, similar to the other. Well, similar, right. yeah. It, it, it an, an emotional tug of some sort. I mean, what with waterfall, um, it, it was a, a it was a classic love story, and uh, uh about the power of, of of a first love and and how it changes you um and i thought that was a crystal small idea that was also huge and if we could actually define that um it would be um uh, incredibly moving in the theater uh, that's you know so that's you know that's um, Ross, there was what another. You look for is it an emotional center of some sort? Yeah. Um, there was, was also que another question from Larry Daggett. Yes, there was. Uh, was your daughter present in a lot of your rehearsals when she was a child, and is that how she became a director? <laughs> um, well, you would have to ask her, um, and she would really, really, really hate me to answer it for her. Uh, um, <laughs> Fair but enough. I I, I will say that there was one moment where I think she she I think I can get away with describing to her. Um, the Pirate Queen opened in Chicago, and it was not doing well. And I went out to see it, and I felt that the storytelling wasn't clear, and I wrote this. I tend to write these big long letters um, to. Alan Bublé and saying this, this is why the story is not making sense. Um, I uh, 
and I sent it off to Alan and he read it and decided that I should join the show and, and, and work on it. Um, but I left it around and Emily read it. And that letter about structure seems to have blown her mind. She refers to it all the time as, as, a, a, de, as a definition of what constitutes a story. Um, it didn't actually save the show, but I mean, you know, no. but it changed it was, my daughter's it was, life. It was an, it was a noble effort. Um, thank you, Richard. I, I, okay. You've stayed way, way past how long you promised me. So I'm very grateful. Um, I'm very I'm, happy to be here. I'm really also excited to see how many people in the room are all working on musicals. Excited and a little bit terrified, but yeah. <laughs> um, we have a, a very large musical theater writing community at True. We have a lot of a lot of people who come to True or into musicals. Musical yeah. is is one of my my life's passions, uh, absolutely. And I'm I'm glad right. that I have uh, have you here to talk about it with me. I'm going to go do my my farewell to YouTube. So uh, okay, I, want to thank you. I will say goodbye. Oh, okay. Then thank you for coming. Um, thank you for having me. It was really fun. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. So I'm going to just say to YouTube and and uh, my podcast people that you you really would love to you really should come and be part of the room and, and meet these people and, and actually have a chance to ask questions. So do email me at trunltd at aol dot com. And um, we've been doing this as a community service since April seventeenth, twenty twenty. This is a hundred eighty seventh consecutive conversation today. I think. Um, and um, we do it as a ser service, and so you can come for free. Um, we're happy to have people come for free. We're happy to have people come from all over the world uh, and be part of this community. Um, however, we also have bills to pay, so if you want to give us a donation or if you want to pay to come, um, this is pay what you can. Uh, right now, we're doing a year-end do donor drive, and we have a matching grant of $12,000 uh, which is very exciting, except we don't get the matching grant until we have the money from our donors um, in our community. So uh, if you could give us a, do a donation now, I would really be very grateful and it will be matched. So uh, you can go to truedonate.com, T-R-U-Donate.com. Uh, Ross, you don't happen to have the link for the, uh, the year-end campaign, do you? Uh, I do not. Okay, no, so... Have... I'll pull it up and put it in. Okay, so you put put that into the into into the uh, chat for me, and and if I if I haven't if it's in there before I finish speaking and saying goodbye to everybody, I'll actually announce it to the viewers out there. Um, so come back and be with us. Join us next week. Join us the week after. Join us every Monday from here to well, in perpetuity, I guess. As long as I can do this, I will keep doing this because I love having people come in and be part of the community and talk to people and hear interesting conversations. So grateful to Richard Maltby today. Um, spectacular conversation. Um, I'm very, very lucky. I'm very lucky to have Richard. I'm very lucky to have the people that are here supporting us. And I'm very lucky to have you out there who are listening to us now. Thank you.